the biggest shift that I have done in terms of my identity, how I perceive myself is that I used to see myself as a marketer who happened to take good photos. Mm. And over time I've adopted increasingly the label of artist because the job of a marketer is to get uh, KPI, like metrics, yes, numbers, big yep. numbers, no matter what is yep. going on in the world, your numbers need to keep up. Yep. Otherwise you're not relevant. Yep. As an artist, your job is to create fucking great shit. Yeah. Am I allowed to swear on the podcast? Yeah, yeah you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One hundred percent. I swear all the fucking time. <laughs> yeah. So that is your job. Your job is to like own a piece of someone's heart. Your job is to make sure that whatever you create to is unforgettable. Emotion. Yeah. Right. To evoke, evoke emotion. emotion. Change yeah. the way they see the world. Welcome to the Superhero Academy podcast. I'm your host, Mark Andrew. <laughs> Hello, superheroes, and welcome to another episode of the Superhero Academy podcast, where my mission is simple, to make you a better storyteller. Now, how I do that? Well, you know, every once in a while I switch it up, but sometimes, sometimes I like to talk about some of the, the challenges of what it takes to tell stories. Well, so whether you're an entrepreneur, creator, or influencer, yeah, sometimes you feel the pain of the digital cricket, right? That, that feeling of creating something, of creating your art, creating your story, creating your business, and maybe not getting the attention it sometimes deserves. So this podcast is designed to support people like you through those kinds of things, to tell you about the trends and things that are happening in the world, but also to expose you to amazing people. And today I am so lucky to have somebody who I hope is going to become a very good friend of mine, but I'm definitely building a, a relationship with uh, today. He's a phenomenal artist. Uh, I would say he's a storyteller. I don't know if you would use that that term, but Benjamin Von Wong, who is just literally been doing projects that I've been literally seeing for, for years now. Uh, you know, I have a friend, and I'm going to give her a little shout out, actually, Jared Decker, who turned you, uh, me on to your, uh, to your work. Um, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Glad to be here. Absolutely. So I... Before I show maybe some of your work, your Instagram, your website, those kinds of things, I would love to hear from you, you know, who you are, what do you do? Like, you know, tell me about how you became an artist and, and you know, what brought you here. All right. Well, the line that I use to introduce myself, I'll just use it now, is, you know, my name is Benjamin Von Wong. I'm an artist and activist, and I've generated over 100 million views for different causes like ocean plastics, fast fashion, electronic waste. Mm. Um, but to answer your question on how I got to where I am today... I guess it's a fairly long story, but starts off with me studying hard rock mining engineering at McGill University. Okay. Uh, working there for, for three and a half years and quitting my day job in 2012 and uh, just going out into the world to figure out what to do with myself. And it wasn't that I wanted to be an artist. I just didn't want to be an engineer. And so I didn't <laughs> run towards something. I ran away from something. And, mm. you know, 10 years later, here we are and uh, stuck in a pandemic and still an artist. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, artist is a is a loose term in the sense that a lot of people can conceive that in a thousand and one different ways. So I'm going to pull up a little bit of some of the work that you've done. Um, you know, I'm going to share a little bit of some of the websites you have and the different things. I mean, dude, your art is next level. I mean, we're talking about art that has done been done for huge brands and huge campaigns that have gone around the world. But these are, you know, art pieces that really have impact i mean we're talking about guinness world record organic views i mean visited by thousands of uh, hundreds of thousands of people and this is art that's made with recycled materials in this case it was straws right mm -hmm. yeah so i mean there, then there's art that you, you did with dell where you have a, a whole bunch of computers that are lined up and I, actually i think there's a better photo of that here that i want to bring up i mean some of the final photos some of the final you know pieces let's say really tell a, a beautiful story and i love that at the end of the day every one of these pieces is about that story it is about the waste that we have in the world it's not just like oh i'm making a campaign for nike or dell or you know whatever company it's actually making a story that people need to hear and that's what i'm you know i'd love to dive into more um but the you know the the, the work that you've done you know both artistically and some of the different things there i mean you know, literally hanging people off the side of buildings and doing work and, and photography and, and storytelling that way. I mean, man, this is, you know, there's, there's art and then there's art at a whole other scale. Um, you know, all the plastic that you've used here to make these mermaids and, and some of these pieces. Uh, and I know you have a, a, an interesting piece that you're working on now, which we'll get to maybe later in the, in this podcast, but I mean, how the hell did you start to learn? Like, how did you start to realize 
you know, I went from engineering in your mind to making pieces of this nature. You know, w is there somebody artistic in your family? I mean, did you try something? Were you commissioned to do something? And then it, you had an aha moment? I mean, like, this is not, this is not just regular, you know, run-of-the-mill art. This is, this is, you know, this is a message in an art form that I think is incredibly impactful, right? By 2050, there will be more plastics uh, than fish in, in the sea, right? That, you know, some people say 2048, 2050, whatever it is, right? But the, I think this really says a lot about what you're, what you really care about. Um, and that's, that's what comes through for me. So, you know, I would love to hear how you, how the hell did you get to this? <laughs> like, how to, you know what I mean? Well, maybe, maybe a good, a good thing to do would be to scroll all the way down to the bottom and mm. that, that'll, that'll show you a little bit where I started. Um, so I started off doing photography, creating sort of these, these things that were just fantastical and surreal just for the fun of it. Like, what could I do? What could I create out of my imagination? Uh, and, and how can I use special effects, practical effects in order to create those? So here we have, you know, lycopodium torches that, which is basically a mushroom powder that just ignites on contact and magicians use it. Ooh. And I, th and I use this for a, a reality TV show on which I was, you know, one of the photographers for a supermodel competition. Um, okay you know, creating portraits. Use, we created a rain machine uh, out of, uh, in order to create those black and white portraits over there. Mm -hmm. They're just or ordinary people. Uh, they're the CEO of, of this website that you're looking at right now, the smugmug.com, uh, was, was, was the one who commissioned these photos. I wow. just, you know, tried to figure out ways to do that. And so, you know, over time, I just started doing things that were more and more crazy, whether that was starting to put people underwater or experimenting with fire. Uh, and, and as these kind of sets got bigger and bigger, I, I think my ambition grew with it, right? You're kind of like, well, if, if I can do this, like, what could I do to make it even bigger, even crazier, even more grandiose? And, and over time, I started to realize the importance of, of marketing and storytelling and figuring out, well, I can't just create content that is beautiful. I need to create content that can attract a headline. So putting myself, those superheroes on the edge of a 40-story skyscraper is, as an example, you know, that's that's me sitting on the edge of a skyscraper trying to set up the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I realized that if you can't describe whatever it is that you're doing in words so that people want to talk about it, then it won't spread. Right. So even though I'm a mm. photographer, I still need to create something that can be explained in words. Yeah. That, that series there with the real world Beauty and the Beast, mm -hmm. you know, that's like um, in the world's largest monastic library, we recreated a real life Beauty and the Beast. And so it has sort of this title that can go with it, that can draw attention but a lot of my earlier work didn't really have that. Mm. Um, and, and so I think, you know, as a result of doing these campaigns, um, here I put, you know, tied, a, uh, tied some people 30 meters underwater in a shipwreck in Bali. Um, <laughs> and, and so I think that was the first time I went viral. That was way back in 2013. And so, you know, oh, really? the, these, these kind of headlines eventually led to work. I eventually started getting paid. And I think I sort of attained some level of commercial success. And that's when I realized that just creating work that gets paid a lot of money kind of felt a little bit empty. I mean, where do you go after you've shot with a major brand, a uh, nice global campaign, fatten up your wallet? You're like, oh, well, I need to do another one. And then do another one and do another one. And what have you done by the end of this? You've, you've created work that has generated revenue and has moved product off a shelf. That, that's literally all you've done. Mm -hmm. And it just felt kind of, I guess, pointless. Um, and I think, you know, I think many people arrive at that point, I probably didn't work hard enough to get there. So it only took me about three years before I got my first global campaign. You know, uh, I felt I felt like I got really lucky with with a couple of shoots. You know, I was in the right place at the right time doing crazy things in a time where not many people were doing it. And so people were taking the safe route or they were doing the campaign that was easier to do or safer in a sense for the brand. But, you know, maybe I think easier it was, to pitch sometimes. No, it's it right. You know, like 2013, 2014, 2015. This was like the dawn of the influencer. Right. This is when like yep. Instagram was really at its beginning. So influencer wasn't even an official term. You, you had YouTubers that were just up and coming. But, mm -hmm. you know, the norm was you know, one piece of content a week and you were considered prolific. Yeah. And then the Casey Neistats of the world started coming up. <laughs> and then it was like, Wait, no, no, guys, you got to do it once a day. And then it was like Snapchat and Instagram. Now you do it every hour. And it's yeah. like this On incessant. Every platform. Yeah. This incessant just create noise, create noise. But when I was there, it was a lot less crowded. Yeah. Um, and so people were doing the weekly thing, but people weren't taking the time to do the monthly thing, right? The thing that took a little bit more time went a l one step further. And that was the space that I was at. It was like, how can I push it one step further, one step further? Yeah. Um, and so I guess after I, you know, plateaued a little bit there, got a couple of commercial gigs that were all about doing crazy things. I, I started wondering, well, 
how can I integrate something more meaningful in my life? Like what were the most valuable projects that I had done that I was most proud of? Mm-hmm. Um, there's this one video that I had made for a little girl who was dying of a terminal degenerative brain disease. Um, uh, her father reached out to me like total cold email and just said, Hey, uh, you know, yeah, I've seen your work. It's gone viral. Do you think you could help us make a viral video? We got this GoFundMe going. And uh, I was like, well, I'm not a videographer. And I'm sure you can find someone. But if you don't, let me know. Um, I'll, I'll be available in a month. <laughs> and so a month mm. later, I check in. And he's like, yeah, we haven't found anyone yet. I'm like, oh, okay. I fly over, stay on his sofa, help them make a video. Within a month, we raised a million dollars. And within by the end of the year, we raised two. We broke the record for most funded campaign on GoFundMe for the first million and the second. Wow. And it was just like, wow, that's the power of art, right? Like art to move the world forward, art to save people's lives, art to fund research. Like that's what I want art to be. And Mm. and that seems worth dedicating your life towards. Was it part partially also working because you had built enough influence in a sense at that time you had built, like, I mean, you know, just to share a little bit about your following right now, you've got, you know, 118,000 followers is not, is not nothing. (laughs) I know you would criticize your own version of, of, you know, how you're doing this and, and how well you're doing on Instagram. But I think you're doing a great job. I think you're telling the story and you're using it as a way of not only putting the final pieces, but also putting kind of some of the behind the scenes and the stories that are going behind it. Um, I mean, do you think that part of the success of why you broke that record was also because there was just a, a, a movement of people that are being inspired by your art? Like by even when it had less meaning? I mean, I, you know, back in 2013, when I did this project, I had the photography community at my back. I single-handedly raised about 30K of that through my audience. Uh, but, but realistically, I, I just provided them with a story. You know, mm. they needed a good story to share what it is that they were about and what the challenges that they were facing. Uh, and it's not that they didn't have the story. They just didn't have anyone who oh, they were living was the story. able, yeah, they weren't able to tell it. Yeah. And so they had already done like the lemonade stands, the 5k runs, you know, get the company on board to donate money and, and get, get whatever they could. And so I think until that point that rates raised just under a hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars, but which no one had, impressive. which is impressive, but they yeah. hadn't, they had never had somebody who like kind of took all the elements of the story, put it together. And so they'd had all the lead work, leg work done. And, and the minute that we made this video happen. So one, they used the fact that I was somewhat of an influencer flying in and volunteering my time. And so I became the, the international photographer that was coming to the help good them. Guy. So that became the local story yes. that then propelled it to national news and then to international news. And the thing with popularity, you know, is that people like to talk about things that are popular. So if, if it feels popular and it looks popular, it creates its own popular cycle and loop and Absolutely. it just grows from there. Absolutely. Um, and this was, once again, in a time where content was a lot less prolific than it is today. So... Yeah. It would be way harder to do today. Way harder Same to do Same story today. would not... I mean, it could, but it, it'd be harder to break through the noise at this point. Exactly. Harder to break through, not only because there is more noise, but because the platforms, like Good Morning America, let's say, yeah. has less reach than it used to. Uh, I mean, and, significantly. And significantly. And just about every news station is the same thing. And so virality today has become a lot more siloed. Like if we were to draw a diagram, so you you have like a pyramid. Mm-hmm. So theoretically, you're you, we... We, we were like, okay, when the internet came to life, we, we removed the gatekeepers. So we had this very narrow pyramid. These gatekeepers were gone. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the promise was that, you know, if the pyramid gets wider, then you can, you can make a living and you can do whatever you want. You can go higher up, yeah. These days, the pyramid has gotten so wide and so flat that you can be a superstar in whatever vertical you choose to, and the rest of the world would because never have heard of you. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and so it's, it's this weird kind of effect nowadays where, you know, Everyone can feel famous and successful, but they might not actually be it or, you know, they, yeah, but, but, but it depends what you're looking for. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It it has democratized the capacity to have more, you know, I I talk about entrepreneurs, creators, and influencers. I think those are really the people I'm speaking to when I create this show. And it's, it's because I identify with all three of them in a sort and, and influencers is just a term that I use because people understand it. I don't actually identify as an influencer, but I do identify as understanding the power of attention, right? And therefore having the influence that 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 has. And so my art is a little, well, very different than your art, but it's not that different from the perspective that I I focus on story. I just focus on existing stories and telling the stories of other people who are telling stories to begin with. But you're really, I mean, you're capturing, like, I mean, you know, I think that you've skipped over some of the steps that that really get you there because it's like, oh, well, I just started doing photography and then all of a sudden I just kind of went to the next level. I mean, 
you didn't just start doing like you were you're pretty fucking good at it like did you did you study photography somewhere did you have a mentor of any kind like i mean you you really went to the next level of photography man i've taken a lot of photos none of them are as good as those <laughs> my personal take right so where do you think you picked up that sense of photography and that sense of storytelling because it probably wasn't an engineering school no. it, was, it definitely wasn't a mcgill i went to mcgill Man, you learn what you didn't want to do in life. Like you said, <laughs> what you want to run away from is what you learn at McGill, my yeah. personal take. But so, you know, where do you think you picked up those those skills? Where do you think that, that came? Yeah, so I guess gr growing up, I never had an artistic bone in my body. My parents tried desperately for me to find extracurriculars. So I played 10 years of violin. I have a black belt in Taekwondo, you know, perfect model Asian was good at math and physics <laughs> um, and when it became an engineer perfect yeah, you, yeah. you did the script like I, you, you I followed the your script parents were really happy <laughs> yeah but on top of that they you know I, I had like extra drawing lessons we had clay lessons I had dumpling lessons like I mean they tried like putting me in everything and I just kind of was absolutely mediocre at everything I did mm. um and and so when I discovered photography after a girl broke up with me I was working a mine in Winnemucca Nevada got in a breakup and I was like, oh gosh, I'm in this 10,000 person town. I'm not even 21. So I went from being legal to not being legal. Mm. Um, like, what am I going to do with myself? The only place to hang out is a Walmart, <laughs> like literally nothing to do. Um, and so I bought a camera and I was like, I'm going to learn how to take pictures of the stars. That's, that's how it started. But so the there combination was... of heartbreak and, and like isolation in a sense gave you, you know, yeah, kind of put a camera it, in your hand. It forced me to try out photography, but there was no indication that photography was going to be the next big thing. Yeah. I mean, I was I was playing paintball at the time uh, pretty pretty heavily, and so, mm -hmm. like, I could have become a professional paintballer for all I knew, and I was doing capoeira on the side, and I was doing parkour, and I was trying to be a stuntman. <laughs> like, these are all random things that I was doing, and I also happened to, like, play with playing with cameras. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when I, when I came back home, I, I think the taking photos initially was, um, it was companionship. Like I could take a camera with me and I'd suddenly have something to do. I could go to a party and not know on anyone, but I'd still have something to do and yeah, some like way, way of engaging people. Mm. Um, and then along the way, I figured this was a way to provide value to people. And so I started shooting a bunch of events. You know, anytime I'd go somewhere, I'd take a bunch of pictures, I'd give them to people and I was able to build relationships. Mm -hmm. I mean, those that relationship building eventually backfired because then at some point it was like, wait, are you inviting me or are you inviting my camera? Um, so I well, stopped bringing yeah. my camera anywhere after a while. That happened to me too. <laughs> yeah. But, you, you know, I, I just kind of went down that path and over t you know I, I even built an event business uh i was doing a lot of events weddings bands all this stuff i was just shooting all the time i just had so much fun doing it until it became a job uh and, you know one day i woke up and i had two jobs and i was like wait what's going on i have i have photography and engineering and i'm not having fun anymore what was this all about so i ended up uh, sunsetting the business just decided i wasn't going to stop taking all these event stuff and wanted to go back into doing fun creative things mm -hmm. um Co it coincided with yet another breakup. Breakups are always wonderful resets and <laughs> opportunities for reflection. <laughs> Some of you use psychedelics. <laughs> other people have breakups. I get it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, I launched myself into this creative project where every day I was going to do a new creative photo. And this is all while I still had a, you know, a day job. And so that forced me to just like take uh, selfies or find people and shoot them. And I don't think my work was particularly great at the time. You can find it on Flickr, actually. If you went mm. and, and typed Von Wong Flickr, you can go all the way back till 2008 and go back in time and look at every single photo I've taken in that in that journey. Wow. Um, but in that time frame, I sort of discovered, you know, the power of Photoshop. You know, I had to, I had to learn so quickly because every day I had to put on a new piece, piece of content. I picked up flashes and I really started to understand them. And I, and I started to realize that, you know, after 100 days of doing this, I was like, and doing a new project every day means I can't do one great thing. I'm just mm. doing one thing all the time. And, it, and like, I don't have time to develop good ideas. And so I started slowing down. I started doing like one a week. Yes. You know, one a week, one every two weeks. And then, and then something happened at that point that I guess made a little bit of a difference was, so I was trying to get, you know, as, as we do when we're starting out is like, how do you build followers? How do you, how do you get more likes? How do you get featured by different people? And, and I started off trying to write guest blog posts. Uh, mm. And so I'd, be, I'd take these shoots that I would do, I would break them down. And that was fine, but it was a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And then one day, the new girl I was dating um, <laughs> decided that she wanted to video my one of the shoots that I did. And this was the one where we were in a studio and we used flour as a replacement for smoke. And we had dancers dancing around. And, and so we threw flour all over the place, completely ruined the studio. Um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, I had a video. And yeah. this video got featured by a site called F-Stoppers, which in the photography yeah. world was... Huge. Yeah. Was just getting started. It was yeah. just getting a lot. They were only featuring one video a day. And so to get on there meant something. 
And this exact same photo shoot that I had did spent the same amount of effort, got I don't know, 10,000 views at the time or something. And I was like, oh, if I have a video for this photo shoot, then I can get so much more traction. So I can go further with the same piece Telling of content. Telling the story behind the story. Yeah, story yeah. behind the story. Mm-hmm. And so now, so, so then I started adding to it. So now every shoot, shoot that I did, I needed to have a video. Every shoot that I did, I needed to have a blog post. And that really helped me grow my following. And I think the reason why is because I shifted from constantly trying to talk about what I was doing, which is when you create a piece of work and you share it with the world, you're like, look at me, I'm awesome. Yes. That's kind of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when you create a piece of content that's around, look at what you could do, now you've shifted from trying to be the hero to being the guide. And, and you are empowering people, you're providing value to them. And you're instantly shareable. Instantly shareable. And so that was how I built my initial following and what I became known for. And mm. by the time I quit my day job, I had 7,000 fans on Facebook. Might not sound like a lot, but no, I have more engagement yeah. <laughs> with 7,000 followers. I could reach anyone in the world than I can do today. Oh, 100%. Yeah. It was a different a different reality. Different like, universe. Like the, the, the algorithms now do not favor that at all. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, the, the capacity to reach people, no matter how many followers you have, is not the same. It's, there does seem to be these weird thresholds when you, like, kind of hit a threshold, then all of a sudden you get more algorithm juice it's kind of it's it sounds horrible but it and and the problem is that now everything is catered to those algorithms yes. like a lot of the work that entrepreneurs creatives and influencers are doing is kind of pandering to that algorithm in a sense and i i find that that's bastardizing the message but what i love about what you've done is that you've it's like when everyone zigged you zagged yeah, I mean, I, I continue to do that today. I mean, I I, a, I refuse to let the algorithms dictate my 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 creative schedule, my work schedule. Like, I don't want to chase the algorithm because, you know, we talk about the future in which machines are going to take over humans. I mean, they're they're controlling like the the algorithms. This amorphous algorithm that no one really knows how it works is controlling the lives of so many people in yes. terms of what they create and what they consume. Yes, and where they get their news. As we as yeah. we saw, like we, we used to get it from mainstream, <laughs> yeah. but now mainstream particularly with Joe Biden in office, is significantly down. You're talking CNN is like down 68% or whatever it was the last I heard uh, from since the Trump era. I mean, that's huge, huge, huge decline. And then you've got people like the Casey Neistat's of the world who you mentioned, right? Like some creators are really able to break through and then build these platforms that are phenomenally powerful. But that pyramid, although it's flat, like it's super flat. And then there's this like spike right in the middle where there's like only a very select 0.1% of people maybe that really can gain so much attention. Um, But all of that pyramid is now clouded by the algorithms. Mm -hmm. And there's a few platforms, there's only a few players, Facebook being one of them, Google being the other, um, I guess, you know, TikTok or, you know, the the companies behind that now are essentially playing some roles, but it's very few people deciding essentially what is true, what's happening, what's, what we're going to see, what we're going to believe to some degree, because it impacts that, right? And, and regardless of what is being shared, because of that filter, there's, it almost acts like a form of propaganda because the filter, regard, like, regardless if it's true or not, right? I'm not talking about fake news. I'm talking about the algorithm's job is to keep you on the platform. So it's going to feed you more of what you believe or what you like or what you're cons- engaging with. And so, of course, it's going to create more and more confirmation bias. Like, oh, well, of course this is this way because I keep seeing it. And everything in my reality that where I'm getting the news, and I say I because I'll, I'll include myself in that, get the news from my black mirror, my, from my phone, right? So the, the capacity for us to break through and tell stories that matter is getting – Ironically, it's never been easier, right? The, the the barrier from idea to upload has never been easier, but the ability to tell a really engaging story and break the noise is, is also kind of, in a way, never been harder. And so fast forward to today, right? You're making these Guinness World Record art pieces. I mean, they're breaking, the, they're, they're getting a lot of people paying attention. Regardless of algorithm, there's people paying, like, I mean, is it is it Jake Paul attention? No. Is it Mr. Beast attention? No. But this still got a lot of attention. What do you think, when you're coming up with the, you know, piece like this made with, with how many straws? 100,000 straws? 168,000. 168,000 straws. Okay. When you're making this piece, and I'll play this video in the background, it'll, it'll be on mute here, because people could see, you know, this piece in the mall in Vietnam. Um... How how much are you thinking about 
the piece itself visually, like obviously the physical component of the piece, but also the story and then the virality of, of the piece. Like, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to have a perfect thumbnail to some degree. Like, like what's your process in making a piece like, like this? <sighs> I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think like, what are the, what are the common rules, right? Yeah. Um, so first off, it has to be something that people find interesting in words, right? I made an art installation out of 168,000 plastic straws that we collected off the streets of Vietnam. Do you want to see it? Mm. It sounds cool enough for you to want to see it. So even if you don't know me, you've never heard of you're me. You're imagining the headline. Yeah, I'm yeah. thinking of the headline. That it's, so it starts there. Yeah. Um, the second from there is figuring out, well, how, how am I going to uh, put a story together that, that people can share and find interesting to share? Mm -hmm. in, in this case, the piece that you're playing right now is a spoken word piece where... Uh, uh, we had a spoken word poet come and, and, you know, remix a piece. And then through that piece of how he talks about how, you know, the, the last straw that broke the camel's back, um, it was a metaphor that he chose to kind of build this entire piece on. Uh, we were showing kind of the, the creative process behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, did we follow the rules of virality? Not quite. This is more like Vimeo staff pick style as opposed to like, yeah, optimized Facebook piece, but yeah. I can still make a Facebook optimized version of, of this. this. So yeah. back in the time, you know, back in the days, the way, you would have done this was like, you know, square letter boxing top and bottom, yep. you know, test out a couple of different intros, just have silent text on, yep. make it simple, make it stupid, make it so that a three-year-old can understand it. That's generally like the, you know, the very simple rule. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from there I, I start, I also try to think about, and this is becoming increasingly important is, is if I am not willing to live a life of being an influencer of constantly putting content out there, well, then I just need to find people who are already doing that and have them feature what I do. Mm. Um, in this case, getting a Guinness World Record wasn't because I wanted a certificate that said Guinness World Record. It's because Guinness Guinness has, you know, uh, millions of followers on YouTube. And mm -hmm. if I get this, it becomes headline worthy. Because yes. now it's not just I collect 160,000 straws. It's I created a Guinness World Record with 160,000 straws. And Which now it's more gonna, impressive. Yes. And yeah. the... And the New York Times or whatever, somebody else can Whichever pick up the place. story. Whichever place, exactly. Yeah. And so now when you write to a reporter and say, hey, I just ha I just got a Guinness World Record. This is how we did it. These are the pieces of content that you can use to tell your story. Are you interested in sharing it? Your chances of success are a lot higher. Yeah. And so I think, so as someone who creates like one or two pieces a year, it's sort of important for me to like make sure that whatever I create has the possibility of being seen by as many people as possible. Otherwise, I don't get the ROI. The client doesn't get the ROI. No one gets the ROI. Yeah. But it is becoming increasingly hard to guarantee any sort of return on investment. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the biggest thing that I've, the biggest shift that I have done in terms of my identity, how I perceive myself, is that I used to see myself as a marketer who happened to take good photos. Mm -hmm. And over time, I've adopted increasingly the label of artist because the job of a marketer is to get uh, KPI, like metrics, yes. numbers, big yep. numbers, no matter what is yep. going on in the world, your numbers need to keep up. Yep. Otherwise you're not relevant. Yep. As an artist, your job is to create fucking great shit. Yep. Am I allowed to swear on the podcast? Yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. <laughs> I swear all the fucking time. <laughs> yeah. So that is your job. Your job is to like own a piece of someone's heart. Your job is to make sure that whatever you create to is unforgettable, yeah, right? To evoke, evoke emotion. emotion, change yep. the way they see the world. Yeah. And I think that's just a more... It feels like a better thing to pursue. It feels like there's a little bit more depth. I mean, I'll, I'll give it, no, <laughs> like, you can't pat yourself on the back in that, but I'll tell you, yes, 100%. Okay. It, it, no, no, without, I mean, Kyler, am I, am I, are we wrong here? Obviously, making art that has real impact and a, me, a, a message that isn't just about selling more of something is going to land better, right? 100%. Yeah. Are you kidding? Like, and it feeds the soul. It's, it's like what drives us. Yeah. So, oh my God, 100% well, yes. I, the way I see it is like people see the art that you are creating and I love that you, you add the word also activism to it because we kind of, here's the thing, in those algorithms, every once in a while a story comes by, by with a turtle with a straw in its nose or, uh, you know, we hear about the problem. We know about the problem. Uh, you know, there's... Uh, a study that was done that I think there's 80 articles that talk about the problem of climate change and one that talks about the solution, right? And that was years ago. Maybe now it's better. I doubt it. It's probably, probably worse. worse. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, whatever. That was the stat, right? We hear about these these pieces of, of information, right? There's going to be more plastic in the ocean in 2050 or 2048, whatever it is, uh, than, than fish. Like, but we we feel small within it. And what I love is that you're taking that story and then saying, how do I make something big 
get a corporation to pay for it or get someone to pay for it, a benefactor of sorts, right? Uh, and it's some, some I'm sure, are more um, philanthropic in nature and some are more, you know, hey, we know that this is going to get more attention for Dell. Well, yeah, great. But you're using their budget. It's, it's kind of a Robin Hood-like, right? You're using their budget to say, let's tell a, re- let's tell a story that really matters and, that, and hope that someone, some kid halfway around the world is going to see this and say, you know what, maybe I can invent something that cleans up the plastic in the ocean or, or hope that it inspires something bigger than marketing, if you will, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, th- I think when we look at change, we often focus disproportionately on the moment of change, that moment of transition, right? We yeah. think of change as binary. People care, they don't care. Yeah. But in reality, like, everything exists on a spectrum, Right. Mm-hmm. Change exists on a spectrum. And so what I do with my work, it's, it's more like if we're, if we're starting at negative 30 degrees and we're trying to get to plus 30, you know, how can I just help continuously create something, create new ways of talking about boring topics, create new ways of introducing different people? Like the work that I do is designed, hopefully, to not preach to the choir. Mm-hmm. I, I hope that the work that I do is interesting enough so that anyone, even someone who doesn't care at all about climate change or the environment, can look at it and be like, oh, that is really cool i wonder what they were doing there and why they were doing it yeah. um and by by educating through adventure by saying hey look 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 at this really interesting thing look at look at all these people that came together look at look at the the way we figured out how to solve all these different problems and this is why we did it it's actually something that was like really important to me i mean you can believe what you want but this was something that was really important to me and all the other people and it, it can be really cool. Like, you don't have to be, uh, I don't know, the, the outdoor hippie that, you know, use, uh, uses uh, Flaw Raven and, like, uh, wears <laughs> all birds. Like, y- there's so many different iterations of how you can be engaged and involved. Yeah. Let's find ways to make sure that those voices also can be elevated and heard. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yes, I try to get companies to pay for this stuff because, ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, I create one or two projects a year who's going to have like budget to throw at art. I think when we think of impact, most people would much rather invest in a tangible concrete solution, right? If you had, if you had a thousand dollars to give away, would you rather, I don't know, do something that feeds the homeless or create art that raises awareness for the homeless? You would want to feed people. But the problem with feeding people alone is that it doesn't address the root cause. Yeah. Yeah. So it never addresses the root cause. You never address the systemic issues. And so how do we change systemic issues? I think culture has a role to play in that. 100%. Um, They have to become part of the narrative that people are discussing at that time. They have to be culturally relevant at that time. Yeah. And and we see that with any topic of any kind. Anything that is brought forward as a as a villain of sorts that can be a global pandemic that could be uh no but it, realistically it could be anything right like mm-hmm. i mean in california they're gonna say it's the homelessness problem that's a, that's a problem or wildfires is the other villain and these are very real villains in some cases but none unless we create culture or narrative or stories that kind of address elements of the root cause and at least can point to it mm-hmm. we have no hope of ever solving the problem you know what I mean? And, and some of these problems are, are layered, and, and many of them are, of many course. Are. Um, you, you know, where, where do you start? But part of what I think I love about the work that you're doing, and I know, you know, the work that you're talking about right now and the RPC you're working on right now, which you, you tell me where, what you can say or what you can't say, but the, the, the idea of this giant tap art piece that you're creating um, is to say we can't, just it's not about you know in the plastic problem for example it's not about recycling at this point it is about literally ending all the machines that are making more plastic we have to stop creating plastic we have to stop using it we have to stop demanding it both as a consumer but also as a producer and we we have to stop seeing as as in a sense this bailout of a solution for convenience essentially because that's where many plastics are used now do i think it's unreasonable to say today or tomorrow all plastic needs to be halted. Unfortunately, there's too many things that are using that at this moment, but but there is definitely ways that we could just completely shut off the tap in so many facets of life. Um, and there's so many solutions that are out there, but how do we, you know, how do we paint the villain and the solution all in one story? Well, yeah, it's going to take you time. It's going to take you, you know, you can only do one or two of these a year to really capture all of that. And, and I think there's more and more pressure, in my opinion, to tell the story of the behind the scenes. Like, I think you even mentioned it, like when you 
did the break when you had some of your your earlier successes and your breakthroughs it was because you're telling the story behind the story that people can kind of like really be in awe of the art in another way um that then lands the message even further if that makes sense because if i saw this you know if i saw this piece just with all the straws if there was absolutely no context like no sign no video nothing that explained to me why this was there i don't know that everyone would get it yep. and and that's i mean it's, it's futile to say that everyone would get it but i don't get that most people would get it but it's with the context of the story and the story behind the story sometimes or the story with the story um you know the 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 headline that gets to be written or the little plaque in front of the piece or whatever it, it is those components have more and more impact on the, the vow or on the reception of that story, if that makes sense. The how. Yeah. People are obsessed with the how. Like, yeah. The how and the why. Picture, the how yeah. and the why. Yeah. It's more impressive the fact that those are straws. Yes. Because like, you didn't know that. I didn't know that before the podcast. When you, saw the, when you saw the photo, you didn't even realize there were straws necessarily. I had no idea those were straws. Mm. Like, I was like, that's a cool photo. But I, had, I didn't give it a second look the minute. You guys start talking. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Some of them are more obvious than others, right? Like, yes, this is clearly laptops. Did you know that they were all reu or, you know, thrown away laptops? No, you didn't necessarily. But this, this little piece here starts to tell that story. That little caption at the bottom tells that yeah. story. Um, and, and then that, this, you know, some of them are significantly more obvious. Like this is very obviously plastic bottles. Um, even with the Dell one, people are impressed with like, okay, what is it? What, what goes into making this? You know, like people are so obsessed with that nowadays and because we have the capability to do it. I, at least for me. Yeah. 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 I think many of the creators and entrepreneurs will, will be very intrigued by the behind the scenes. I agree with that. Um, so you start, finding these stories, the impact. I love that you explain the process and that you, you're, you're very candid about the fact that like, it's important to know the headline before you start. Um, I can imagine that somebody is sitting at home and they're saying like, look, I've got these crazy ideas, but I, like, how the hell, like, how am I going to start? Like, how am I going to get this in front of somebody? Like not everyone just has access to Dell or, or whatever, right? Like what would you tell somebody with a vision of something like this to do like what would what, what advice would you give a, a you know, I don't want to use the cliche but a starving artist or somebody who's just like at that stage where they they really don't know their niche they they kind of want to tell stories um what would you what would you tell somebody yeah so if I don't know if someone didn't know their niche and they wanted to tell stories I mean I think you need to figure out what you want to tell stories about what's important to you um like it starts with understanding yourself. It's sort of like in a relationship, you can't go say, I want to find the perfect partner without first figuring out who you are and what you care about, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a certain amount of self-exploration self that's required. Yeah. From that point forward, you want to try to find like, okay, you need to create proof of concepts. You need to say, I, so, so when I decided to do environmental projects after pivoting from those big corporate gigs and you know, mm -hmm. tying people underwater and so forth, uh, no one wanted to work with me. I'm talking like going up to nonprofits and saying like, I want to, I'd like to collaborate on something. I just want to make a difference, like find a way. People are time poor and they're risk averse. They don't want to take, they, and they don't want to, they don't, they can't see what they've never seen before. They can't see what's in your head. Mm. And so I had to go out there and prove that I could do something and this is what it would kind of look like. And mm. then I had to do it wrong a couple of times before people were able to say like, oh, I get it. So the only reason why Dell hired me was because they had seen the mermaid on 10,000 plastic bottles. And they said, oh, that's really cool. Can you do the same thing with electronic waste? Yeah. But if I hadn't done that, 10, 000, that mermaid on 10,000 plastic bottles, which was entirely self-funded, mm. it would have never happened. Uh, and similarly, like if, if they hadn't, if, if, if Starbucks hadn't heard about the fact that I had already pre-created these, they probably wouldn't have authorized any kind of budget and so on and so forth. And so there's sort of this track record that's really important. And even with nonprofits, so like a, a Greenpeace wouldn't fund a project unless they knew that you were a real activist. How do you know if you're a real activist? Well, you have to have done things in the past. You can't just wake up one morning and say, I care. Well, prove it to me that you care. Show mm -hmm. me what you're going to do with the, amount, the fact that you care. And so whether it's a creative collaboration or an activist-based thing, like people don't want to waste their time. Yes. And so 
make me believe that it's going to be worth my time. Yeah. Show me something that you tried, but just couldn't do because it was lacking that little bit more funding. Yeah. Right. Tell me what you learned about the last project and show me how it's going to be, you know, better. Um, you know, talk to me about how, if only I was involved in this last thing, it would have been so much better and why we're the perfect match for one another and how the work that you have been trying to do this whole time is wrong because this is how I would do it, right? Mm. And so there's this, almost like this, like, I think flirtation or uh, you, you need a, you need a, so the job of the artist, the job of the artist is to make people, so an artist can see something that doesn't exist yet. Yes which is super frustrating. It's a super frustrating place to be because you're going out and you're trying to get people to understand your pitch and so forth and da 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 and it's not and <laughs> I just remember one of my friends told me they gave me the great piece of advice and says it is your duty as someone who can see something that doesn't exist yet to find a way to express it so that mm. others can bind to your vision, right? It's mm -hmm. all about setting forth that vision. And so if we bring this back to activism for a second, what the environmental movement lacks today is narratives of hope. Right? We talk constantly about how everything is screwed up and how we're, we're never going to figure it out and how we're doomed if we don't act, et cetera, Because our et cetera, algorithms et reward that. And they, so the psychology of people. 10 to 1 ratio, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. And so it's like, well, well what can artists do? They can paint narratives of hope. So like while the, the scenes that I paint are sometimes sad, the, the, the amount of collaboration and co-creation and, and, and the bringing to life of something that never existed in the past you know, that magic, that spirit of, of, of collaboration is, is present. And that's what I really try to do within the behind the scenes. And that's why the behind the scenes are, are that much more important, um, it, yeah. specifically in the work that I do. Um, the one piece of the puzzle that I haven't been able to crack yet that I hope to crack with this upcoming project, um, which basically was a three-story tall faucet uh, that is just, levi like those levitating faucets are just pouring plastics into a variety of different environments. And it's a portable art installation that's going to be shipped to France. And so it's launching, hopefully, in a gallery on October 7th, if COVID doesn't shut down the entire country again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but this art installation, essentially, um, you know, it's it's one of the first times that I've created something, I hope. Oh, you can kind of see it in the background there. You can see little pieces of it. I'm going to I'm going to give like, you know, it looks really small. Yeah, it, it it's significantly I mean, I've seen I've I've seen things that I we cannot show, but the yeah. you know, Can't there's definitely it. what I'll say is it's it's very impressive. Um, you know, this 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 tap is is quite big. <laughs> um, and you know, it's it's definitely yeah, anyway, I just wanted yeah. to quickly show that and I'll I'll, I'll actually show Oh, you can well. show the concept art. Yeah, I, I want right to there. show exactly. So here's a concept art of like what that would look like. <laughs> so yeah, so so you know what this work does that none of my previous projects have actually done is that it can be taken out of context. Like the art installation itself tells a story. It doesn't need a person, doesn't need a character, doesn't need, you know, the mermaid on 10,000 plastic bottles, remove the mermaid, mm, doesn't quite work so hot, right? Yep. Um, uh, the laptop spirals, if you get rid of the character and you take the laptops and you place them on a beach, you don't really understand what it means. Yeah. But you take this one, which is basically an invitation to turn off the plastic tap, the tap of the tap that is pouring plastics into the environment. Very clear. You can put that in front of any environment. So what I'm actually hoping to do with this project that I've never done in the past is I want to take this. I'm going to I'm going to edit a bunch of them out onto a green screen and that if anyone wants to to edit this in, in front of the White House or in front of some company's headquarters and, and challenge them to do something about it. Mm. I think that would be really fun. And so I think the future of art, and this is what I'm playing around with right now, is in how do you open source the art that you create? Mm. You know, my the, the attempt at moving from photography to art installations was actually built upon the idea that, you know, today people want experiences and they want to take their own photos. And so why not give everyone the ability to talk about something that's important to them by building an art installation instead of just building a photo set. A photo set can be used once. An art installation can be used over and over again. <laughs> what would be even better is if someone would actually commission something that would last forever yeah. instead of just asking for something temporary at a festival. And so, you know, <laughs> building I- Building man versus burning man. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, for me, uh, I, I'm thinking of like, how can we empower everyone who wants to say something but doesn't quite know how yet? How do we make it easy for them to talk about these very important topics? And so, you know, when this project launches in October um, and, and, you know, anyone who's interested in signing up for updates, you can go over to turnofftheplastictap.com or giantplastictap.com and you can just enter your email address. We'll send you kind of an update of 
of when this project is live and an invitation for you to co-create something. And, and I'm exploring all sorts of stuff like Instagram stickers and, 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 and different filters or lenses. Like how can we make it as easy as possible to interact with this? And, mm. then, and then it becomes one piece of this multi-layered puzzle. Keep adding layers to the puzzle so that you can maximize the number of ways that someone can interact with it. Mm -hmm. They can almost like they can meme it, like you said, by putting it in front of a meme green it. screen. They can yeah. essentially do whatever it is. They can Photoshop that in front of, like you said, the White House or whatever it is. Like mm -hmm. it, it, it actually becomes participatory of sorts, right? And yeah. and it and it calls forward people to play a role, if so, if they so choose to so essentially use their skills, their art, their influence, their power, their superpower, if you want to call it that, um, in collaboration with the story. Yeah, I I noticed that. I would, I would say that, you know, I definitely, so there's, there's two things that I want to point out that are kind of behind what you just said, nice. right? The break me down. <laughs> well, it's not breaking you down so much as like, at the end of the day, as an artist, you have three stories to tell. The installation has to tell a story of its own in an ideal world. The behind the scenes of that story is the story you have to tell. And the third one is you have to tell a story to some to a company. You have to tell a story to someone about something that doesn't exist, that's in your mind, that maybe you've made a render of, like that, like this render, where you can kind of pitch it this way, right? To say yes to it, to commission it, to fund it, to to enable it to happen, um, and to kind of, you know, give you the 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 runway that you need to take off with it, right? That scenario of telling those three stories is now layered into that fourth piece, and this and this is the the second piece is how can you allow people to engage with it as well? How can they make it part of their story? How yeah. can they go in front of this plastic tap, take a selfie, or put it in their Instagram stories, and be able to say, "Yeah, I believe this too. Like this is part of my identity. I identify with, you know." what Ben has done or, or, and, and even if they don't know you, they don't have to know you. I identify with this message. I believe in this message. I support this cause or I support this message. I want to turn off the plastic tap. I want to get involved in some way, shape or form, or I want other people to get involved. And essentially, you know, even from, like you said, from the lowest layer of engagement all the way to the highest layer of engagement from slacktivism all the way to full on activism, you people can use this and as a tool to kind of, point and to sig virtue signal of sorts all the way to literally just like use this as a as a as a as a way of really making an impact or a message kind of come forward um and i think all of that that spectrum as you called it right it's not just a specific moment of change that spectrum of change is so valuable to every layer of those people because look some people are in India, they 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 you know they're, they're not going to see the plastic tab because it's just not going to be in India, or maybe it will be, but whatever. Uh, the, the long, long story short is they're somewhere abroad, they're somewhere away from this thing. They can't go to the installation, so they can't necessarily, you know, take photos of it or whatever. But they can use the green screen. They can give it a like. They can leave a comment. They can share it. They can do some things, right? And because it's a worldwide problem. It's not a Canada problem. We're here in Montreal, but it's it's not a U.S. problem. It's a everywhere problem because this is a message that is deeply impactful to so many people and so and literally everyone, in my personal opinion. But many people will resonate with that message. And I think you said something very wise there, which is this piece, unlike maybe maybe the, the straw piece, I think fits that too. But the this piece is inherently shareable in another way and is interactable because it can go, it can be in different places and stay in those places for a period of time um, in a way that the Dell shoot or somebody, you know, the guy with the bamboo bike on the side of the building or whatever, hanging on the side of the building, that can't, if that makes sense. So I think you've got, you, you're starting to tap into like the virality. Like it's like you've learned all these little layers of how the system works, how PR works, how storytelling works, how video works, how photo works, how headlines work, um, and also how um, corporations work, how probably government entities work, how um, even recycling, you know, where do you get this plastic, how all of that works. Like you've had to pull together so many different skills to make that happen, um, and it's really impressive, you know. Like, I, like seriously, like Bravo. It's it's very very impressive 
to see all the different layers of what you've been able to string together. And it's not, it, it is layered. It, it, and just like the problem, you're finding a way to actively bring all these layers of solutions to this one story. And, it, and it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, and the, the the other the other thing that you haven't touched upon and that's really new in this project with the tap yeah. is is that what I am trying to do and create with this one specifically, like I've done so many plastic pieces, so what's different about this one? Uh, this one I hope can be a symbol. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's something that could be ideally remixed by different installation artists or otherwise, because it's something that's that is actually a remix of something else, right? Like I remixed this idea of the levitating faucet and I just corrupted it with plastic waste. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's something where you, if you type, turn off the plastic tap, which is a really popular term within the the, the, the activism space and in, in plastic yeah. specifically, when you go on Google Images, there's nothing. No one's figured out how to visually, visually craft that. something and make it into a symbol. Um, and, and, and maybe that, that idea of a symbol. So you mentioned before that there are some of my pieces of work that are harder to explain and harder to understand than other. To me, the most successful photograph or piece of art is the one that requires zero words to explain. Exactly. I think I've gotten pretty good at you know the one sentence to explain the context. So uh, and now I've you know I've you know went from one sentence down to hopefully one word, and now one word I'm hopefully down to no words. Right. Then you can really hit that a picture tells a thousand words, and that's when I, I think you've created something that that works. Yes. Um, now whether or not this actually works once it looks live i don't know i mean so much of art well, today i think it, it, it it's working that i don't need words to understand <laughs> an element of the message yeah like yeah. it's clear i can see even just this render here you know it's not super clear that it's plastic but if you know even that render whatever and when i see the actual photo right which i've seen some some pieces of me personally i i think it's very clear what the message is yeah yeah so yeah, without I'm, any words, I'm very, I'm very, very hopeful for this one. I, I think it's something different. Uh, I hope it goes far. I hope people remix it and and play with it. But you know, you don't know, and 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 you don't know. That's kind of the, the the hard thing is that okay, worst case scenario, it goes out into the world, no one sees it, it goes nowhere. Yeah. Okay. Digital, digital cricket. <laughs> Best case scenario, you put it out there and and everyone sees it. Nope. <laughs> 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 but then even in a best case scenario what's going to change yeah i don't know and this is where this is where it becomes hard to be an artist and an activist because since i've started this problem plastic production so plastic awareness has gone up sky high over the last four years yeah plastic awareness everyone thinks it's a problem everyone agrees that's why we have like global bans that are happening all over the place for single-use plastics it's starting um yeah i kind of feel starting. like i've heard that but i kind of still feel like i see it no, it's it's starting. It hasn't been yeah. like fully enacted, and and, yeah. and and then and then for every push, there's a counter push, right? So, uh, Canada decides to ban, ban ten single use plastic items. Okay, and then and then the Plastics Association pushes back against Canada and sues them for calling plastic waste a hazardous material. And so now there's like a lawsuit going on. It's like this is just this is how the world works, right? Like it's just okay. We the world wants one thing, uh, you know, money wants industry, the other thing. Yeah, industry. Everything's wants clashing. That. But then in the middle of that, you know, over the pandemic. Plastic consumption has increased by two hundred fifty percent. A one hundred. I mean, yeah. So it's 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 two hundred fifty to three hundred percent in in. I in did North not know America. that. And and it's like, but but you know why, right? Like takeout, obviously, um, and all the ordering online and so forth. And and now everyone's scared of COVID, even though COVID lives longer on plastic than it does on organic materials. But mm. but you know, like, so awareness doesn't equal change. Awareness alone doesn't equal change. No. But it is part of the change. And so you know, as an artist, I, I feel eternally frustrated because I don't just want to create art. I wish I could be more involved in the solution space. Mm. But for now, this is like I feel like I create what what the world needs and what I can do with it. Um, but even though like so on 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 paper, you might look at my my profile and be like, oh, this guy is great. He's doing what he loves. He's doing something meaningful. He's getting a lot of attention. I am still like eternally frustrated because I can't figure out what happens next. How do you connect these two things together? Like I can get my work in front of world leaders or I can get my work in front of decision makers, but, but that doesn't mean they're going to take me seriously. They're thinking about their quarterly budgets or thinking about their reelection. They're thinking about all these different things. And I'm just the artist that's created a piece. And they might use it as a virtual signal. It, they might. Yeah. So, so, but, but then deep down, I like, there are, data points to show that this does matter. And the fact that, you know, the past work that I do had a lot less longevity than the current work that I do. Uh, and it's interesting mm -hmm. because so long as plastic pollution remains a problem, my work will always be relevant. 
And as yes. long as my work is relevant, people will continue to talk about it. Like it's shareable for a long time. Yeah. My, yeah. you know, art that hasn't been like my mermaid on 10,000 plastic bottles is a five year old project. And, and like last year it got on some stamps that were put out by the United Nations. Um, and, and so it keeps coming back. And, and I think that when you pursue, it's almost like you want it to be irrelevant. I wish my work was irrelevant, <laughs> but it is not, that's weird. That's, that's, but yeah. it is not. And, um, and so if we put on the business hat for a second, I don't try to get followers, but I try to own an entire domain if you type environmental photographer or environmental artist on yeah. google i'm gonna show up and yeah. so i've so by actually even though despite turning my back on one algorithm i guess i'm i'm part of another algorithm which is the algorithm of of you know seo that that, that yeah. google plays around with and so i think that's how i compensate for it and how i'm able to still survive despite being really stubborn about like what kind of content i put out and what's worth my time and what i want to put my f attention and focus on mm. Yeah. Wow. It's so layered. I, I find it, I think, I think you said something very impactful there, which is that the, you are as an artist experiencing still the, yeah, I'm doing what I love and I still feel like I can't crack the code of yep. what happens next. Like, yep. and, and if only it went more viral, if only maybe, maybe if it, Maybe if I did it this way, or maybe if I did it that way, or maybe if I put it in front of the actual White House, like maybe it would have that that moment, maybe that cultural moment might happen where it it it, it creates whatever action to be to be had, right? Um, yeah. Well, it's so behavioral change defined by B.J. Fogg, who's a Stanford professor who studies behavioral science, defines it as you know you need to have three things to change someone's behavior. You need a prompt, you need motivation, and you need ability. So you need to be reminded of something. Mm -hmm. right? And at that moment of being reminded by something, let's say it's an art piece, yes. you have to have the uh, a large amount of motivation to do something about it. If you, your motivation is like, meh, let's say you watch the conspiracy and you're like, oh, that was tragic. Okay, I'm going to turn off the TV now and you just walk away. No, no change is going to happen, right? Yep. So you need that motivation level and that's usually in the quality of the story that's being told. Um, you know, and, and then the final piece of that is ability. You need to know what you can do about it, what action you can take. Yes. And I think with these you know, yes, you can say, oh, I'm going to stop using plastic bottles. And that's why everyone targets those small individual actions because it shifts the way you perceive your identity. I am someone who cares about the environment. And that is the first step at starting to align yourself in the right direction. Now, at some point, though, after you've taken all these individual actions, you kind of hit a bottleneck because it's, you start to realize that it's not just about the individual. There's the entire collective that now needs to follow along with that. And that's where it starts to become frustrating. Um, so when you start dealing with these big systemic problems, then then you, then you start just being frustrated. And I remember studying this. Um, so there's this um, thing called Bill Moyer's Movement Action Plan. And, it talk, and, and he basically studied all these civil rights movements and so forth on how, you know, whether it's the feminist movement or the, the, the black movement, like how, how these different milestones were accomplished. Um, and, and he says, like, you know, for the bulk of the life of the activists, they are miserable because they are losing. Mm -hmm. Because you're always losing until you start winning. Until you win. <laughs> and so that could be 10, 20, 30 years of just losing all the time. And I'm like, man, that is a really terrible profession well, to have thing, chosen. Well, the thing I've is, chosen to be a loser. The thing that you're looking for is always in the last place you looked. Right? Like yeah. in, a, in a weird way, right? Like well, why I keep looking until you find it? But it's, but it's part of that, that. And hopefully you just get that payout. Hopefully, hopefully the plastic solution, you know, comes forward and this work becomes quote unquote irrelevant and it becomes, you know, uh, part of the history of it. Um, but it, you know, it's difficult to, to do. I think, I think the other thing, you know, I, I, am thinking about, I, I'm very fascinated by what you do because I'm also thinking about like, what can I do to use the farm as a, as a canvas mm. for, I love what you're doing at the farm. Yeah. Yeah. I would love for you, you know, you, you got to come out. Um, I, I, I was thinking about Google earth art, right? Like how can I, what message, what can I do to like create a message that will, yes, attract a ton of people to farm and all the things and people come and do the selfies and understand the Instagram culture and like pander to all of that without losing sight of the message, understanding that I have to write the headline, understanding that like all those, those things. But how can I build a story that is bigger than me that really just says something truthfully, like powerfully? And... And I don't know that I have the story. I definitely have like a concept, which is some level of Google Earth art, 
like what what would I expect in a field? Like what would draw me to a field? Well, I, I always thought about the the crop circle idea and and how <laughs> aliens are not it still it garners a lot of attention. Um, what can I do to like really 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 draw some some attention to that? And then how can I paint a picture that doesn't just say this is a problem, but that also says here's a solution? Like I mean, what? you are providing a solution, which is what I think is so interesting, right? The farm is yeah. not inviting, is not telling people what's wrong with it. It's yes. telling it's telling people, look at what we can do yeah. with land. Yes. Look at what kind of community we could build. Look at what kind of people we can attract. And look at all the other people who care about this too. You're not alone. Yes. And if we if we can come together and, and we can do all these cool things, imagine what is possible if more people joined this movement. Yes. And so it's almost like, you're you you are creating a, a a model a blueprint for success hopefully that others could you know interpret and follow along and so i mean the marketing part of it so you're you're saying creating one big piece of google art i almost feel is not it'll be a lot more powerful have you seen the um, biggest little farm on netflix yeah, of course right yes right and so so they didn't need a piece of art to tell their story because their story was intrinsically cool. Now, can we add a piece of art to it? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely add I think we could add a piece of big, art. Big, epic piece of art. I mean, I think art. the backstory behind that is that farm is owned by billionaires and mm -hmm. it's in California. So they're getting a budget to do a Netflix series and doing the whole thing. And it's started by some guy who also had experience filming yeah, wildlife. Yeah, yeah. Nah, 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 nah. Like he had all the right pieces just like you do um, in, in telling your, the way you tell your stories. Um, and I know you're always looking for those pieces, but I'm, I'm, I'll say today that I'm interested in funding one of your next pieces. And and I don't know, I even have the money, but I'm just interested in doing it, right? Like I, I will find the money because I know that I can find brands and, and or just raise it myself to essentially do something of that nature. But I, I'm trying to figure out how, because here's the thing with the solution is like a lot, it doesn't, it doesn't give the punch that the problem does, right? So, Two things go viral, yeah. awe-spiring, enraging. Awe-spiring is so much harder to do. Like it's so it freaking narrow compared to the plastic tap is, is significantly more impactful and it, it it's more of a guaranteed hit compared to, you know, what would be the antithesis of that? Like turning off the plastic tap, like how would you represent that? And then it wouldn't have the same impact, right? So in this case, the plastic is the perfect villain and the villain then tells the beginning of the story because every every story needs to start kind of in a sense with the negative reputation environment and that villain, right? So plastics has a negative reputation environment and then there's a very specific villain in this case. It's kind of, you know, the, the manufacturing of plastics to begin with. But the idea of trying to hit it on the hero is so much harder yeah. than trying to hit it on the villain. So I know I need the villain or I know it will help me I really want the focus to be on the hero and I don't want that hero to be me. It's not about me and it's not about our farm. It's about the community and what all of that can do. And we've, we've tapped into it before. Like the farm had its first big viral success when we were able to build earthships. So you know what earthships are? You've heard of earthships? No, tell so me. We actually built earthships on our, uh, an earthship Earth? on our land. Earth, earth ships. ships. Yeah. Like so a they're... spaceship, but an earth Okay, I'll ship. literally, I'm literally going to Google it. You'll <laughs> actually appreciate this. That's, I can't believe you haven't heard about it. I've this. never heard of them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm um, like the opposite of a farmer. Yeah, but it's <laughs> I'm not a, really it, a terrible. No, but here's the thing: it's not. It's not really human. just a farm uh, thing. It's buildings built out of recycled materials, built uh, out of bottles, cans. So this is all cans, for example. Got it. Right. Yeah. Um, yep. Let me uh, let me go back here and and uh, what should I do here? Open image and new tab. Great. So this is. Buildings built out of tires, bottles, cans, recycled materials, essentially. Yep. Um, and so in 2012, we brought Michael Reynolds, who's the architect who invented Earthships in Taos, New Mexico, mm -hmm. and kind of the New Mexico. Oh, I, I know. I've seen his work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, his, his name is, he's called the Garbage Warrior of yep. sorts, right? Yep, yep, and yep, that was yep. the name of the documentary. And so they did these kind of amazing, interesting, intricate buildings. This one is not as pretty as some of the other ones. Like, you know, some of these buildings are pretty freaking cool looking. And so we built one. On our farm, we raised, you know, money for Kickstarter. This is back in the heyday of 2012. So <laughs> Facebook Different and Archive. Story. Yeah, it's just, a, it, you know, if I had to do it again today, I don't know I would be as successful. And I have more followers today, but mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's, it's different, right? Um, 
that being said, we had so many people showing up. There's so much momentum. There's so many things. But what was beautiful at that time is that the villain of the financial crisis and kind of the year of the protester in 2011, like the, the, the climate at that moment was perfect for it. Um, and then the need for that solution was like very real. And now post pandemic, well, I'll say post pandemic, hopefully, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, Fingers whatever crossed. tail end of at least first fourth big wave. wave, yeah, fourth <laughs> Fourth, you know, fourth big wave, which you can kind of see as one giant tsunami of sorts um, with aftershocks of sorts um, has kind of hit. There is that that feeling again. So mm. it's the right moment. But how how to tell that story with the villain and with the hero and really shine the light on the hero and have it be a permanent piece of art. Like I it has to be building man, not burning man. Mm hmm. That, that's my, like, need for it, right? So it has to be building men, which means probably going to involve organic matter or plants, quite literally. What could we do that gets MTL blog to talk about it, but not just MTL blog? Like, how can it, how can it be a headline that the, even the Wall Street Journal, well, Wall Street Journal is maybe the wrong one, but New York Times or something would talk about or, or, or entrepreneur.com can talk about because there's different spins to the different elements of this. But the, but how can you get these places to talk about it, um, and do it in a way that's truly inspiring? Uh, I mean, I think it's, uh, I think it's possible. I mean, I think, um, I, mean, it's I, I hear, I hear that it's harder. <laughs> Absolutely agree. Yeah. Um, that's why less people do it, and that's why when you figure out how to do it, it'll be a lot more popular. You know, you that's think fair. of, you think of something like uh, the Gangster Gardener. I don't know. I, I, I've, I've, had, I've, I've had him on my podcast. There you go. So you know, <laughs> I literally had him on my podcast. Is gardening exciting? No. Our no. gangster is exciting? No, but a gangster gardener is fucking exciting, right? I, I, yeah, <laughs> he had the right term for it, and he had the right platform, which was TEDx. Or right. TED, I think yeah, it was TED. TED, yeah. Ted but he, he also had done the work. He had the right background. He had, he had the right experiments. He, you, you know, he, like every, which we have, too. Which, which you can't, yeah, exactly. And that is, that is a process of iteration. And so I think this idea is it's an intersection of unexpected elements. In your case, if you're creating something uh, that you want to live forever, um, it's, it to, it's, 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 so it's slow, right? You're using organic matter. It's slow, but yeah. like, how can you use slowness to your advantage? I would say, well, what if this is an art installation that looks different with every season? What yes. if this is an art installation that grew? I don't know. What, if, what if, what if, okay, I'm just going to throw something out there. What if it was like a, 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 a face yeah. that you could constantly change Yes. by arranging objects, tables, whatever. Yeah. But the hair were like trees. And yeah. then maybe, maybe it's like orange trees and now suddenly this 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 face has orange hair yeah and then and then this face has you know different different hair and then but the face could be someone that could be representative of someone in the community it could be a celebration of a person that has inspired you i don't know like that could be one simple way and, and you can imagine like this face you can uh, check out this face from google earth that changes with the seasons yeah i i now. thought about going to the garden center and every week getting all the flowers that are flowered at that moment and then planting them next to one another mm -hmm. so that week after week after week, the message, whatever be, be it visual or written or visual and written, I mean, it's both the same in a sense, but you get what I mean, would literally like move with the season because this week it's this flower, next week is next to the next. And then you by planting them next to one another. That's cool. Then it would, then the, the, the art piece would have to be done over time where you'd send up a drone every day or every week, send it to the exact GPS coordinates and literally take a picture, duk, 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 time lapsing it moving. The yeah. message almost like literally being written in flower. You know what I mean? Like, and, and, and flowers and trees, but it, you know, I don't know how to... But how do you make that interactive and, and long lasting? Like, how do you make, how do you make it so that someone goes and visit it? So I think of like Horseshoe Falls in Yosemite, yeah. you know, every year, you know, at some point the sun goes behind the falls and it becomes a fire falls. And so yes. you have people lining up to do it. It's like the, or like the, the blood moon, like everyone takes yes. pictures of the blood moon and it's like, okay guys, we get it. Yeah. How can you create something like that? So that, you know, it's also interactive on the, on the human scale, not just the Google earth scale. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then they have, but they have to be there. They have to see it. And while they're there, yeah. they get to learn about this whole new way of being and living and which which and which is which is exactly it's the entry point yeah. into an alternative lifestyle yeah and that alternative hopefully won't be even called alternative I, my work will be done when we no longer call it the alternative mm -hmm. the alternative shouldn't be 
that people who live in a homestead or who have connection to their food and grow their own food um, and who want to live in community, that shouldn't be that every time I say the word community, it's like, oh, commune cult, <laughs> wild, wild country. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, show. It's like, no, no, wait, hold on. There's no religion here. Like, there's no, there's no dogma behind this. This is just like, what if we lived more in harmony with nature, right? It's like, for me, it happened when I learned that if everyone lived like the average American, we would need 4.1 planets to survive. And I was like, oh, but I'm Canadian. Must be better. No, it's it actually works. five planets because <laughs> we just have like less people per capita. And I was like, oh my God, like that's me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and then, and then, so I identified as an activist. I went to the Wall Street, you know, you know Occupy Wall Streets and I was there, but I just, I couldn't identify any longer. I went to, I even went to the Paris Climate Agreement and I was, you know, I saw that whole thing where they went around the, the what is it, the Arc de Triomphe, and they made that whole, Greenpeace had done that whole sun-like thing where they put paint all over the ground and on the street, and I see these things, and I was like, yeah, but mm, I don't know. There was something that was just missing the entire time I was there because it was just a bunch of people talking. Mm. I was like, yeah, we agree that we're eventually going to do this thing, and I'm like, I get that, that there's value to that, but people can back out like Trump did. Mm -hmm. People can, it could just change, or they're just not going to hit the targets, or, or it's just a way of getting, like, the win without any real win. And and so it just, it felt, I felt like helpless and that's back to the ability piece. It's like, what ability do I have? And then that answer became, well, I can plant more trees. Like I can, I can build things out of recycled materials. I can just try, I can experiment. I can use this farm as a sandbox, but I need to do something so powerful that I can actually get the bureaucrats and the system behind me. Because right now, housing is a, a problem, right? Affordable housing is becoming more and more of an issue. But if you were to become a farmer, you could build a house on your farm, but you can't do it without, until you become a farmer. But what, what, what point am I a farmer? At what point, look, I take care of all the finances of the farm. I do a lot of the accounting for the farm. Am I a farmer? Even if I spend less time in the field and more time behind the, behind the books. Like if, if I'm figuring out how to make art pieces that are gonna bring people to the farm, Am I a farmer? Like, when when do I cross that line? Is it just because of how much garlic I sell and how much money I make? Because that's the line. That's the current box. So I know how to play that game, and I'll, and I'll do it, because we planted the garlic. It's done, right? The work is there. And we're having our harvest dance party to clean it all up and, and get it going, right? But the as they clean up uh, the garlic, harvest the garlic and clean it the garlic. So I'm using ways of innovating to build community. I'm kind of using these different skill sets to make that happen. But I still feel like if I can make one really powerful statement that's super simple but, but understandable at the, at the view of an image or the view of a quick video or a 15-second, 30-second reel or whatever, if somebody could see that quick little clip or that quick gif or that quick thing and understand the message, then that's, that's where I think you know, we, can, we can kind of have a ho another hockey stick-like moment for our community because that, that earthship was a hockey stick moment for us. And it, and it, it led to the, it led us here. And now part of my innovation or, and, 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 and I, and, and also the dedication of, of a lots and lots and lots of people and volunteers and people who are there at the farm all the time. It's because of them that we're now getting to a place where people can kind of come there comfortably, but the next move beyond like setting up the basics of comfort and being able to receive a ton of people is something deeply more impactful, like deeply more, I don't know. It, it has to, it has to hit you in a way that, that is, that is just different than like, Oh, we have a farm. And it's like, yeah, okay. But then that farm is living and dying based on convenience. Like the reason why our farm is doing okay is because we're so close to the city. We're 20 minutes away from downtown Montreal. Um, but most farms can't replicate what I'm going to do. And once I've done it, it becomes harder and harder and harder. It's like that pyramid thing again, right? As, as everyone starts getting into the game, that pyramid starts to flatten and less and less people are going to get there. So how, how can I kind of really pave the way to say we can actually, because I, I do see laws that can be changed where people's backyards and homesteads could be built much more cheaply and sustainably if they're involved in farming, if counties or sections of land would no longer be dezoned or rezoned for residential to build a bunch of or condos, but instead would be rezoned to build integrative communities. You know, so there is, there are like real solutions that I think 
I can see, and there's real like specific policy changes that I would w- be willing to put behind that, where I'm like, here are the direct actions. And like, I, I've always been inspired by the Coney 2012 uh, thing where they were like, tweet these exact 20 people and these exact 12 people because that can make, you know, Joseph Coney famous. And, and I thought that was brilliant. And if you did that on a very specific level, like if a small mayor of a town or like the, you know, I don't know, the, the agricultural minister of Quebec got like a hundred or a, even a thousand tweets directed at them, like they're, they're going to pay attention. Like, they're, like they don't get tweeted at very often, you know what I mean? These are very low level. They're not Donald Trump. They're, they're, they're people who, who with a small amount of noise can be reached and, and then being invited to a dinner or to, 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 and if you pick those people, like imagine the next step is I want these 50 people at a dinner to talk about how we can change, uh, integrate farming into communities, even in suburbia, like fully, let's have that dinner. I think that that's doable. But, so I, I kind of see the campaign behind, I see the story behind the story, but I don't yet have the, the idea of the punch fully. I've, I have some version of it, but that's where I'm at. But it almost feels like you don't need that big of a punch if all you need is a few thousand people motivated super lo- hyper locally. I mean, yeah, I see. I see that there's always it's always great to get a lot of attention. Yes, but you don't need it. So you can. That's fair. That means that you can start smaller. You can do smaller. You can do smaller. I, I can make that dinner powerful anyway. experiments. Yes, and you could probably pull that dinner off. Yeah. I mean, if anything, you have a lot of ingredients that are already really, really solid. You have True. a plan, you have an understanding, you have a community, um, you have case studies of what it could be. You you might need to f- bring a couple antagonists to your side and say, like, even these guys who are on the polar opposite of the political spectrum think it's a great idea. I need um, the photo op for the for the politician, though. Like, if Justin Trudeau is going to show up, I need I need something that he or she, whoever this, this influencer person could, is. <laughs> They can, they can stand behind. Because I always say, like, when my mom and the mayor can shake hands in front of something and say, we want more of this in our town, that's the day that it will mm-hmm. start to proliferate. And then I say, and then behind that is investors, and, and I call them, you know, the, the, the hippies of sorts. Like, if the activist, hippie type, you know, granola, whatever word you want to use, not trying to be derogatory in any way, when those people who are, like, real purists about the movement can get behind it and investors can get behind it and um, my mom typical italian mom who just you know wants her <laughs> son to do well and the mayor and i say the mayor but it could be the prime minister or whatever if they can all those stakeholders can come to the same table and say we want more of this in our town then i think it will proliferate and that's kind of my theory mm-hmm. you're right you're right that i'm i'm actually it's like i'm going for the big hurrah but i don't necessarily have to do that i can go with the smaller wins um yeah. I mean, and I mean, they're not, they're not they're not mutually grow. exclusive. Yeah, they're, right. they're actually. I can build can the whole plan and just to make both of them happen. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. You know, I think of um, uh, what's his name, the guy who started the green school in Bali. Yep. John. Yep. Something. I know who exactly what you're talking about. I don't know. I can't remember his last name. He right just now. started by building his own house. Yeah. Uh, you know, his own house out of bamboo, super sustainable, really cool, really extravagant, very luxurious. And then he started building a village and then he started building a school. And then now he's sort of taken over this. Like, that's why it's so much easier to do in Bali. But it's so much easier. It's not, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's cheaper, but it's also the regulations, the way of doing like, yeah, yeah. Because trust me, I can build a building tomorrow, but it's the red tape. Yeah. yeah. It's the prop. That's the problem that we have to solve in the I first place. You. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's literally the red tape that says, well, wait a second. Why aren't we getting behind? Projects like this, like we, I should be having, and it's not just me, this type of solution should have way more attention, but it's not getting it because it's just, it's not able to get the, the headlines like Donald Trump can, or it's not able to get the headlines like uh, Tesla can you know, or mm. Elon Musk can. And so there's, there's something that can be done there. Um, and I'm interested in figuring that out. I, I just, you know, I, I, I would love to ask you, um, Maybe I don't. How long have we been running here? Well, an hour and twenty. Oh, okay, almost. Okay, so we'll we'll wrap this up. But I, I'll ask you this question, which is, um, I guess twofold. One, it's kind of inspired by the question we spoke about right before we turned on the podcast, right? Um, you know, you said something, and maybe I'll let you quote it. But the. I'm curious as to who inspires you 
right? I'm curious as to like what creators or maybe other artists or other photographers or other people maybe traditionally have inspired you. And then I'm curious as to the question that you pose and I'll let, I'll let you say it because I think you nailed it um, and you have the references behind it, but it's, you know, along the, those lines of not what would you do if you couldn't fail, but what would you do if you did fail and you would do it anyway? Yeah. Yeah. That was uh, Seth Godin. Yeah. Actually, I heard him on someone else's podcast, uh, Farnham street blog. Um, and yeah. And that was just, he says like the, the question of like, what would you do if you couldn't fail is a stupid question. Um, because there were so many things that you would do if you couldn't fail. You do a bunch of things. Of it's not, so it's not challenging. It's not it, the joy. There's no joy in it knowing that you're going to succeed. Um, so a more interesting question is, you know, what would you do if you knew you're going to fail um, and, and you're guaranteed to fail? What would you do anyways? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't know if I have a really good answer for that question, but I thought it was such a thought provoking question. Mm. Um, because so often we focus on the result instead of the journey. Right? Yeah. the destination instead of the journey and this this forces you to reconsider like well what's what's a life worth living what mm. is something that you'd be happy to do every single day uh it reminds me of another you know when we think about so when you're struggling to figure out what to do what if you broke down your ideal week and like what would your what would you do be, be doing with your time mm. right? because ultimately that's how we live our lives it's week by week it's yeah. not moment to moment yeah so 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 if you say well i love talking to people um well then this podcast is perfect because it gives you the excuse to invite and reach out to new people over and over again if you love going out or if you love traveling then you should find ways to structure your life so that you can do that and that helps you it's a far more interesting question than i think what profession do you want to have because to what prof- that's just an output yeah right? that's just a, a means and, to it's an Im- end. and it's implying that you're going to use it as a way to buy other thing or, or yeah yeah exactly. it's like basically buy, buying yeah. your happiness yes. that's basically every single consumer yep. <laughs> uh, marketing thing out there yeah um and so yeah so those are just i guess a couple thought-provoking questions but in terms of who i look up to or who i follow i don't i don't know i i don't i don't have this um idle mindset i don't like look up at individuals i think everyone's interesting and everyone has something to teach and there's something to learn from everyone so i spend a lot of time listening to nonfiction, okay. um a lot of different audiobooks um uh it doesn't really matter if it's marketing or life or otherwise i just think that everyone has something to teach and i'm super curious at the idea so i think i that I live on the intersection of worlds and I am someone that is extrinsically inspired, not intrinsically inspired. I don't sit at home and come up with brilliant ideas. I need to go out and meet people and talk to them and Mm. hear their perspectives and through that conversation. So like now you've just kind of planted this seed of like a living organic art. So now this in the back of my mind is just like, (laughs) well, what if I had 30 acres? (laughs) Yeah. What if I had 30 acres? What could come out of it? And I wouldn't have had that thought otherwise because there would have been no reason to think about it. Um, And I think, you know, it's funny because, Many people, like, when you go into this creative brainstorm process, they're like, well, let's just remove all limits. Like, what what do you imagine? And I find that to be a really frustrating place because when you're in the business of creating things that haven't been done before, like, everything's going to be an idea that's, like, too expensive to create or too hard to do. And so it's far more interesting to think about, well, give me a couple constraints. Give me, give me like, what's realistic, and then I'm going to start pushing the boundaries mm-hmm. of what, what those look like. And I think within those boundaries is where you get to be creative. Um, yeah. So... Yeah, I kind of sidestep both your questions, I think, but that's no, not yeah. really. I, 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 I think I think you you said something no very relevant, which is that you're not idolizing or looking up to any specific person, but there are people who have inspired you along the way, and there's different layers of that inspiration that are just found, like you said, extreme, extrinsically, meaning going out and interacting, you yeah. start to see, oh wow, there's potential in there, um, and I think you're exposing elements of your process. Which is like not just, hey, I, if I can dream anything, what would I dream? But more so, what do people dream? Where are the limits of people? Like, it, it, I think you kind of said something fundamental about what your art does, which is that you are putting, you're finding where the, where the lines in the sand are and saying, well, what if we went like, it's a little bit further? I mean, what if we can push it a little bit near, this way, that way, or whatever, you know? Um, and I think that's very wise because that allows it to build over time, right? Like, It's actually, you can use, rather than just always dreaming the craziest of dreams, right? Sometimes by making it a very specific and achievable goal, it's significantly more impactful and more reasonable to get people to to 
to fund and to get behind, right? Like, I always find it fascinating that NASA has a hard time raising money for, where, or they have to justify, the government has to justify why we're spending so much money on space. And it's very interesting because it's, it's a huge conversation right now. Uh, Jeff Bezos and um, uh, Richard, Branson. Richard Branson both went up to space. Some would argue Richard Branson didn't go up to space, whatever. They both went up to space. They're spending billions of dollars at the end of the day building companies that are about having fun and bringing tourism. And some people are saying, well, oh, fuck these billionaires. They're like, why aren't they solving problems here on Earth? And they say the same thing with Elon Musk, right? Why do you want to go to Mars when we can just spend all that money and all that time making something happen here? And I think it's like the first thing I'll say to that is everything that they're innovating is still happening on Earth right now. All those dollars are being spent in their system in the current ecosystem, and they're funding engineers and people to figure out things that will apply to Earth as well as Mars or will apply to Earth, uh, Earth as well as space in some way, shape, or form. And I think those breakthroughs are not to be underestimated. That money is not leaving Earth right now, okay? Yeah, it's going up in space and doing these things, but it will have implications on Earth too. So like, like Starlink will, for example, to you know, uh, global low earth satellite or internet systems that will connect the world in, in many ways. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. I'm not here to judge it. I'm just trying to say, I think it will create innovation. But what I like about what they're doing is that there's something about what they're doing that is trying to take that box and just expand it a little bit. Now, are they doing it properly? Do I like Jeff Bezos or do I think Richard Branson deserves all this attention? Do I think Elon Musk is good or bad? I'm not here to judge whether they're good or bad. I think there's lots of bad things that some of these companies or the companies that they've built have done. I also think there's lots of innovative things that they've done, right? Um, yeah, it, it's it's weird, right? It's like a hard place to, to find ourselves because sometimes the forefront of innovation is, is a little messy. And, you know... But I think the lesson to be taken away from those folks, whatever you think about them, is that they tell a really great story. Elon yes. especially. Well, right? Like he's able to get... Unbelievable. He is able to make you believe that his company is going to work. You know, way back when it was it was, it was not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and even him, he himself would agree, like, it's probably not going to work. 50-50 chance of failing. And he was just like, yeah, oh, probably, I think actually he, more I think going thought, to fail. I think he, I've seen interviews where he talks about like 80, he's like 80% chance of fail. I think 80% with SpaceX or something. Yeah. Anyways, but basically he launched himself into two endeavors that had like very little very chance of success. And then there's also Neuralink, if yes. you know, whatever, whatever you think about that. So he basically he's, like, he's going like biotech. He's going, uh, oh. he's going space. He's going electric. Like he's, he's, he's pushing the boundaries of what people are doing, but he's doing it in a way that, that is aspirational. It's saying, look at what the future could bring. Yeah. Let, let's do, like, I can do whatever I want. I'm going to create a cyber truck that is going to, like, just polarize people because fuck them. Who the <laughs> hell cares? Because I want to show. But it's brilliant. I, I want I want to introduce you to the future again. I mean, let, let's just make the future fun. Yeah. Right. And I think that's where a lot of, like, sustainability folk, including myself, and a lot of this environmentalism stuff is just so depressing to listen to. It's I like, agree. you don't want to be friends with, like, like it's it's where like the angry vegan trope comes from, right? Like yes. We kind of all kind of embarked on that that bandwagon, but we need to like find ways of making it exciting and positive. So there there are some folks who are doing this really well in in in, in like MySpace. I think um, the Game Changers is an example of a really exciting documentary that talks about how you can unlock the you know like how gladiators used to have a, a, a predominantly vegetarian diet and mm -hmm. and and so on and so forth and and they just talk about the best athletes in the world who are accomplishing the most without ever needing to touch meat is a far more interesting way than saying like look at these animals that are getting like yes. brutally murdered all the time and it's like saying no let's improve yourself let's like unlock your potential let's discover what the world could be and so you know the the future that you're trying to paint on this farm is this idea it's not just sustainability it's not just no it's in fact limit it's like what's what goes over it's re regeneration it's it's evolution it's figuring out the intersection it's thriveability of, it's like oh. what how can we thrive even better than yeah. ever before like how can we regenerate the soil that it does things that we didn't even believe were possible any longer right. like how can we do things like you know we have trees on the farm that literally have branches of like it's four and one pear trees so mm -hmm. it's like one tree but with four different pears growing on the tree <laughs> And people were like, I didn't know that it was possible. I'm like, well, it is. You know what I mean? Like, and I would love to see yeah. a tree of life where we have like, you know, I don't know, 365 different fruits growing on the same tree just to represent every day of the, of the, of the, of the calendar or whatever it yeah. is. I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like we can do things that are just so different and it would be so powerful to try that, like to Absolutely. really attempt these things. Um, and I, I, yeah, I think what you said is, is beautiful. It's, it's, it, it allows us to imagine something fun again. Yeah. Yeah.
I, uh, I feel like I got to leave it on that. Any, any last words? I mean, uh, you know, here's what I'll say. If you got to the end of this, you already know where the links are, ladies and gentlemen. You already know where to find all this information. You can go on Instagram, uh, type in Von Wong, V-O-N-W-O-N-G, and find him. But you can also find the links down in the description, of course. Um, anything else you want to leave us with? Any last, last words? No, I think that was a great note to leave it on. Like, just a little stab of positivity here. Make it, make it fun. <laughs> make, make it fun. fun. All right, ladies and gentlemen, see you in the next one.